Hi friends, I'm Jake. And I'm Miss. And we're Bored Down Under. Today we're teaching you how to set up and play Awaken Realms' The Great Wall. Now, we are on the human and the rulebook was pretty gnarly, so if we make any mistakes during this, we will fix them up in the corrections subtitle. So please turn those on at the start of the video. Yeah, so we're going to be learning how to play the base game set for a standard two to four player competitive match. Um, there is some difference if you're going to be playing a solo or a co-op game. So if you're playing one of those game modes, just check the back of the rule book. Awesome. All right. With that said, let's figure out how to build and defend the Great Wall. In the Great Wall, players take on the roles of generals, striving to earn their clan the most victory points, which is represented by honour, and collectively they need to defend the Great Wall against the Mongol invasion. Now you can bring great shame to your clan if you're ignoring wall defence or you're monopolising certain resources in the game. If this is the first time playing the game, the game comes with a number of cards that have variants based on which mode you're playing, either solo, competitive or cooperatively. We recommend splitting these up and then storing them as separable as possible because it's going to simplify setup down the line. We'll walk you through this now. Some card types have cards with the cooperative symbol on them denoting that they are used in that game mode. The cards that need separating here are the horde deck, the tactic cards, and the general cards. Note that the general cards also have two Reed Clan cards used for two player games and one solo general used for, well, you guessed it, solo mode. Additional cards used during co-op and solo mode that can be set aside for the purpose of this video are the event cards, the emperor's request cards and the six teal coloured solo command cards. Now we'll move on to setup. In this section we'll set up the board based on player counts but we're not going to discuss any of the components until we get to the gameplay. First, place the board onto your table with the side up based on your player count as indicated on the time track. During a two player game, an AI clan will take part, making it a three player game. Place the resources, barricades and wall components nearby. Create a shame token pool by adding 10 tokens per human player and then place them in the same accessible area, returning any unused to the box. Place the time token at the start of the time track. Four player games start on the 4P space. For both a two player or three player game, the time track starts on the 3P space. Shuffle together the artifact cards identified with this card back. Draw three, placing the drawn cards adjacent to one another at the top of the board and returning the remaining cards to the box. Place the nine barricades in the barricade spaces of the board. If playing a two player game, take the three barricades in the left row and place them into the horde invasion spaces in the left column instead. This column can be ignored for a two-player game. Horde cards identified with this card back represent the invading horde. If playing a two-player game, remove any horde cards with the horde symbol in the row's left space and return them to the box. Now everyone should shuffle the remaining horde cards and place them at the top of the board beside the artifact cards. Fill the first row of the horde invasion spaces with horde cards from the top of the deck working from left to right. For a four player game, one additional horde card will be drawn and placed, but I'll discuss where it gets placed later during gameplay. For now, just draw and leave it near the horde area so that it will prompt you later on. Shuffle together the tactic cards identified by their red backs and place them in the War Academy's coloured tactic space. Shuffle together the general cards identified by this card back and deal two to each player. Repeat this for the advisor cards identified by their teal coloured back. After dealing advisor cards to each player, draw four from the deck and place them along the advisor track at the bottom of the board. Place the advisor deck nearby as it will be used throughout the game. Each player chooses one of the generals dealt to them to play as for the game and one advisor to sit face up beside the general and act as an active advisor. Now, ideally, you're going to want to look for synergies between your general, your advisor and the game's artifacts. But if this is your first game, then just forget all that and choose the one with the best hair. The remaining general is going to be returned to the box and the remaining advisor is going to be placed face down under your general card with the supporting advisor symbol visible. Each player should then choose a colour and take all of the components of that colour for them to use during the game. This is going to include six command cards, eight clerks, ten spearmen, four archers, two horsemen, one player screen, one honour marker, and finally one T-track marker. 
Each player places three of their clerks into the clerk space of the board and their square honour marker to the start of the honour track. Each player takes resources from the pool based on the symbols found at the bottom of their general's card. These are wood, stone, gold and chi. Then draw a tactic card equal to the number beside your general's tactics card symbol. Finally, players place their tea track markers in a stack at the tea house. The order of this is based on the numerical tea value at the bottom of each general, with the lowest number having their marker at the bottom of the stack, and the highest value having their marker at the top. Final setup for a three player game would look something like this. There's a tiny bit more setup for a two player game, so some of you might want to skip through this next little bit of the video. If playing two players, take the read command card and the general card, and then place them visible to both players. Choose any unused clan colour from the box and take the tea marker, three clerks and spearmen of that colour. Place the reeds tea marker on the bottom of the stack and the clerks in the lumber mill, quarry and gold mine. And that's set up for the game. Now we're going to move on to a component overview and the gameplay. Yep, so the only thing to explain here before getting right into the gameplay is the tea track stack. The tea stack acts as player initiative. As we work through the game, I'll refer to T order, and that basically means that the player with the highest marker goes first, followed by the next player down to the player with the marker lowest. Generally, anytime there's confusion around who does what when, resolve it in T order. Additionally, this works as a tiebreaker, so anytime there's a draw, including uh, determining the winner, resolve that in T order as well. Now, the game itself plays out in phases, and that's represented thematically as a year. The phases are then represented as the four seasons. The game flow repeats through spring, summer, fall, and winter. However, during the first year, both spring and summer are skipped. So let's talk about what happens in fall. Fall is the most in-depth season and where players are actually going to take their turns. This is where the worker placement happens, the engine building, and where players are going to fight and defend the Mongol horde from invading. To begin with, each player chooses a command card from their hand and plays it face down onto the table. Every player has the same set of command cards to choose from, and each one has up to three effects. Every card has a primary effect which the active player, that is, the player who's played the card, gets to resolve. Most cards have a communal effect which is the effect that non-active players get to perform in T order. And finally, there may be a third effect which again is performed by the active player. The most common effect on these cards is moving a number of clerks onto the board, and this is the worker placement aspect of this game. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Once every player has played a command card, they all get revealed. In T order, players place their command card in one of the available spaces alongside the edge of the board. For each card in the command track, we're going to perform three steps. First, you're going to resolve that card's effects from top through to bottom. Then you're going to activate any locations on the board that might need activating. And finally, you're going to clean up and defeat any horde cards that might need cleaning up. Don't worry about what any of that means right now, we'll cover it momentarily, but the most important piece of information there is that when placing clerks onto the board, you won't actually receive the rewards until the location activates. Let's discuss locations and clerk placement now. There are 10 locations on the board. Each location provides an action or resource per clerk that a player has on it. Additionally, each location has a type. Special locations are identified by large green circles and have no limit to the number of clerks that can be placed there. Provided at least one clerk has been placed into a special location, that location will activate. Regular locations are identified by smaller red circles adjacent to the location. These circles represent the maximum number of clerks that can be placed at that location. Additionally, regular locations will not activate in the activation step unless they are full. This means it's entirely possible for you to place clerks in one turn and not actually gain rewards for that turn. Some locations have yellow shame icons next to them. Now, we'll cover shame tokens a little bit later in the video, but rest assured they're bad and you don't really want to pick too many of these up. 
If any player is the only player to occupy a location when that location activates, that player will take one shame token from the pool. Fortunately, there aren't too many of these locations on the board, but players may want to form tentative agreements on going to one of these locations to avoid grabbing these shame tokens. But I emphasize tentative because there's nothing stopping the later player in this agreement from going elsewhere and leaving the first player to get shamed. Now, when actually placing clerks, you may move them from the available pool, or you might move a clerk from a regular location, provided that that location is not full. Also, an important rule to remember here is that if you're placing clerks due to the effect of a different player's card, you cannot place both of those clerks into the same location. They have to be in different locations. All right, now, as we mentioned, there are plenty of locations. They all have unique rewards when you activate them. So let's talk about those locations now, starting with the tea house. This location is one of the more simple. In current tea order, players with a clerk in this location get to move their tea marker up one space in the stack. If the location was filled with two clerks of the same player, that player's marker moves straight to the top of the stack. Now, it's important to note here that because this uh, is resolved in T order, the current T leader placing their clerk here will gain absolutely no benefit from going here. Next up is the War Academy, which again is quite simple. For each clerk placed here, the player draws one tactic card. Now, tactic cards themselves are cards in your hand that you can play during the game to receive a reward when a certain condition is met. These conditions are almost exclusively related to combat. In addition, each of these cards has a bonus section with a chi cost. By paying this chi cost, you instead may claim the reward in that section of the card, provided its condition has been met. We won't discuss these in detail, but they are fairly straightforward once you understand the attacking rules of the game. Just remember, there is an icon reference on the back of the rulebook, and you can use this if you ever need to. At the bottom of the board is the Emperor's Embassy where for each clerk a player has there, that player may choose one of two actions. The first action is paying two gold to add a new clerk to your clerk pool. Players start with five available clerks, but may recruit up to three more for a total of eight. The second action is to hire a new advisor from the four available at the bottom of the board. And the cost of this advisor is equal to the number of active and supporting advisors that you currently have plus the one that you're about to hire. Once taken, advisors to the right will shift to the left and a new one will immediately fill the market up, keeping four available for purchase. This newly purchased advisor can be used as either an active advisor or a supporting advisor. Let's take a moment to talk about generals and advisors now. The only difference generals have after setting up is their unique ability found beneath their name. All general abilities provide some sort of power that is multiplied based on the number of supporting advisors that that general has below them. For example, General Yang Miao <clears throat> says that each time you recruit a horseman, you may also recruit a spearman for two of any resource, and the number of spearmen that you can recruit is equal to the number of supporting advisors that you have. When an advisor is hired as a support, they are placed face down beneath the general with their support icon clearly visible, so that you can see how many you have. Alternatively, each advisor has their own ability, and when hired as an active advisor, these abilities are active for the rest of the game, allowing you to build a little engine. Since these advisors grow more expensive each time you purchase one, I recommend some careful consideration when making these purchases. Across the bottom of the board are the resource generating locations. These are the lumber mill, quarry, gold mine and temple. Each resource location acts in a similar manner where players will earn one of that resource for each clerk they have there. They may also earn additional resources if they have an overseer in that location and have at least one clerk there. For example, if I have a level 2 Overseer in the gold mine and one clerk when it activates, I would gain a total of 3 gold. 
Whenever one of these locations fills up with clerks and is activated, each of the players who have a unit there may pay the cost to upgrade an overseer for that location. To do this, those players pay the amount as indicated for the next upgrade of their current overseer. If that player does not currently have an overseer for that location, they pay the first amount and place any soldier from their pool into the first box each player can only have one overseer in each location, and bear in mind the more of these that you have, the less people you'll have to defend with. Now with the exception of Chi, any time a player earns at least one resource from these locations activating, that player may choose to donate one of their resources to the warehouse, as indicated by these red arrows. Doing so will increase that player's honour by two, that means that the resource can only be used for building fortifications and may be used by any player. Speaking of donations, we're not after any money, but if you've liked the content so far and are happy to support the channel, please hit the like button. And even better, if you want to see more of us and help the channel grow, uh, please hit the subscribe button. The next location is the builder's encampment, where walls and barricades may be built per clerk on that location. Later on in the video, we'll discuss what these defenses actually provide, but for now, barricades cost two of any resource, except Chi, and increase the defense of that wall segment by two. Alternatively, a player may build a wall upgrade. The cost of the next wall upgrade on any given section is depicted on the right-hand side of its location. Each subsequent wall becomes more expensive, the defense value of each wall segment is also depicted, this time on the left, with no wall upgrade providing no defense. Anytime you purchase a fortification, you will earn honor equal to the cost of that fortification. The final two locations on the board deal with recruiting and moving units around the wall. Now we'll come back to the logistics center later about how you can move your units, but first there's a bit to unpack about the barracks and how you recruit your units. For each unit a player has at the barracks, that player may pay the recruitment cost of a particular soldier type to place that soldier onto the wall. When recruiting a soldier, that soldier may be placed in either the rest zone of a wall segment or placed straight into an attacking position. Soldiers in rest zones are ignored and are safe when resolving offense and defense. Now the type of soldier that you recruit has a big effect. So let's start with the spearman. To recruit a spearman, it costs you two stone and one wood. Spearmen may only attack a horde card in the first row. To attack a horde card, take your spearman and place it onto any one of the unoccupied squares at the top of that card. These are known as the horde's vitals. When a spearman covers one of these spaces, it is treated as a wound, and that player takes the reward depicted on that space. If there is ever no empty vital spaces to place a spearman, you must place them into a rest zone instead. To recruit a horseman, it costs three gold and one wood. Horsemen act similar to spearmen, however when recruiting a horseman, it may attack any card in the invasion area, not just from the first row. Additionally, when placing a horseman on a horde card, that horseman must cover two orthogonal vital spaces, letting the player claim the reward from both. If there are not two orthogonal spaces available, the unit may not be placed on that card. Finally, to recruit an archer, it costs two chi and one wood. Archers act differently to the other units, and when being recruited into an attacking position, they must be placed onto one of the available red squares of a wall. If there are no red squares unoccupied, they must be placed into a rest zone instead. When an archer is placed onto a wall in an attacking position, they immediately shoot. Take one wound token from the pool and place it on any available vital space or any horde in that wall segment. It's important to note that when an archer does wound a horde, that you don't actually get the reward that's covered by that wound marker. Now, bear in mind that the barracks is both a special location and has a shame flag, so it can be a bit of a hot topic at the table because sending even one of your clerks there will cause the location to activate, but doing so alone will mean that you'll get a shame token for your clan. The last location is the Logistics Centre. This location allows you to move any number of soldiers from a rest zone in one wall segment into the rest zone of another. You may also move ranged units in firing spaces on the wall to another firing space or to a rest zone as well, but you may not move them from a rest zone into a firing zone. You also cannot move horsemen or spearmen off of a horde card. 
And that's all of the locations on the board. There was quite a bit to go through there. The board does do a reasonable job of depicting each of these actions, but if you ever do get confused, the rule book provides a detailed breakdown of all of them, so check that out. Yep, now that we know where our clerks can go, let's go back to those command cards and see what's happening there. Once a command card has been fully resolved, we need to activate the locations. Remember that any special location will activate as long as it has at least one clerk in it, whereas the regular locations will only activate once they've been filled up. Now, the order that these locations get resolved in is decided by the active player, and the active player is the person whose command card has just been resolved. When activating a location, players are going to do that in T order, and for each clerk in a location that a player has, that clerk gets resolved simultaneously. So for example, if I had two clerks in the barracks and I was resolving that, I would be attacking a single time with the two units that I've recruited. The only exception to this rule is the Emperor's Embassy, where uh, each clerk is resolved individually, meaning that if you hire one advisor, the next advisor is going to go up in cost. After activating a location, the clerks in that location get returned to the player's available pool at the bottom of the board. And this is as good a time as any to mention that some cards have something on them called an advanced activation. When you get to perform an advanced activation, you pick any location on the board and activate it. The activation is just like a regular activation with two differences. The first difference is that if you're activating a location that has a shame icon, you get to ignore the shame token that you otherwise would have obtained if you're the only clerk there. The other difference is that you may activate a regular location that hasn't been filled up yet. Those are the only two differences meaning you're going to gain resources and you're also going to return your clerks to the pool just as a usual activation would. Yep, so once all the locations have been activated, but before the next command card is resolved, players will need to check if any horde cards have been defeated. This is done by checking whether all the vital spaces on a particular card were covered up during the activation step. If any spaces remain unoccupied, ignore the card, but for any card with no remaining vitals visible, that card is defeated. When a horde card is defeated, there's a couple of steps to follow. First, take note of which player is currently covering the most vital spots on that card. They'll get to claim the card face down in front of them after these steps have been resolved. Remember, archer wounds do not count towards this value, but horsemen count as two since they cover up two spaces. At the end of the game, this card will be worth honour equal to the number in the lower right corner of the card. Next, some of the soldiers on that card are going to be killed. To the right of the marker on the time track, there's a lethality value that represents the number of units that each player will lose from that card if possible. Now if the player has more than that many units on the card, they get to decide who lives and who dies. All the killed soldiers get removed from the board to the player's pools. Any soldier that was not killed gets returned to the rest zone of that wall segment and all wound tokens get returned to the pool. At this point, it's a good time to mention that at any point in the game where a soldier might be killed, that player is able to pay two chi to save that soldier, sending it back to the rest zone instead. That horde card is given to the victor and any horde cards in that invasion line are immediately slid down. And that's it for the steps that get resolved after a command card. You're going to continue on with this, resolving the next command card and following those steps until there's none left. And that's it. Now winter is on its way. During winter, the horde invades and your defenses are going to break down. Starting with the leftmost wall segment, all archers placed on firing spaces get to fire adding one wound each to any vital spot on any horde card in that column. Next, perform another check to see if any horde cards have been defeated, just like you would in between resolving command cards. And now it's time to see whether any horde have actually breached the wall. Before we do that though, let's recap on the horde card anatomy. We'll discuss the back in just a moment, but the front of each horde card has four important areas. We know about the vital spaces and the honour value for endgame scoring, but each chord card has an attack value which we'll be using in a moment. 
Some Horde cards also have special abilities that make them harder to kill or harder to defend against, and it's very important not to forget about these, so make sure you check each time a new card is revealed. When checking to see if a Horde has breached your defences, first add up your defence value for that wall segment. This is the sum of your barricades plus the wall itself. Then sum the offensive power of the Horde cards in that column. If your defense power is equal to or greater than their offense power, then the wall is safe and nothing happens, you get to move to the next wall segment. But if the offensive power is higher, the wall has been successfully breached and the horde is going to do some damage. For each horde card in the breached location that a player does not have a unit on, that player will take a shame token. Second, check the lethality value of the current year and each player kills off the required soldiers on the horde cards involved. Any soldiers removed this way are replaced with wound tokens to retain the damage done for that horde. In addition to these soldiers, all archers on firing spaces of that wall get killed as well. All soldiers killed here are done so simultaneously and that's important for some card effects. Also remember that any time a soldier gets killed, you can pay 2 chi to save it, returning it to the rest zone instead. Finally, remember that any soldiers in the rest zone are safe and they're immune from the effects of an invasion. That's the end of the invasion, but winter's harsh and all the barricades are destroyed at this point, removing them from the board. Before winter ends and we start a new year, we need to check if the game is over, but we'll circle back to these game end conditions a little bit later in the video. For now, we'll assume that you haven't somehow found a way to win in the first round, and we'll bounce into the new year and start off with spring. To begin, move the year track forward one. Next, a new set of horde cards invade. To the left of the current year is the horde spawn value, and this depicts how many horde cards will invade this year. During the game, when placing horde cards, always follow this rule. Draw the top card of the Horde deck. In the first row of the invasion spaces, starting from the leftmost space and working right, place the drawn card in the space that is empty. If all the spaces are full, check the Horde symbol found on the back of the topmost card of the Horde deck. This will indicate where to place the Horde card that you've just drawn. If you would ever need to place a Horde card in a column that is full, a raid occurs. To do this, simply discard the Horde card and remove shame tokens from the pool equal to the number of players. This basically just shortens the game. Note that there is no actual direct consequence to the players when this happens. After Hordes have invaded, the two leftmost advisor cards in the market get discarded and the remaining ones slide down. Two new advisors get drawn in their place. And that brings us to fun time in the sun time. To much dismay, summer is the shorter season. It starts by earning passive income from overseers in the resource locations. The income is of the resource type matching that location and is equal to the level of that overseer. Next, you may pay two chi each to discard any number of shame tokens that you may have unfortunately acquired. Then discard all the command cards that had been played and resolved in the previous year. Finally, each player may choose to gain two honor for each of their command cards that are in the discard pile, or instead they may choose to return all of those discarded command cards back to their hand. The game has a max of six years, and each player has six command cards, so it is possible to play through the entire game without returning any of these back to your hands. Is it a good idea? Well, that's for you to figure out, and for me to also figure out. And that brings us back to fall, where it all repeats again. So let's jump to the left and time warp to the end of winter where we can discuss end game conditions. The game can end if any of three conditions are met. Either the shame token pool is empty, the year marker has reached the end of the track, or players have upgraded all of the available walls to the third level. If any of these conditions are met, end game scoring happens. Now most of the scoring is tracked throughout the game, but there are a few small calculations to do at the end. At the start of the game, we laid out three artifact cards across the top of the board. Each of these artifact cards provides an additional way for players to score points at the end of the game. These are dynamic each game, but will never change mid-game, so players need to take notice of them at the start and tailor their game plan accordingly. 
Additionally, each player may also have some horde cards that they have claimed by being the biggest kid in the park at the time, and each of these has their honour value in the bottom right corner, which will be added to your final score. Unless there are any shame tokens on it. And this brings us to finally discussing how shame tokens work. Any time a player gains a shame token, they have one of two options. Option 1, they place that shame token under any of their soldiers, not clerks, from off the board. While this shame token exists, you're unable to recruit that soldier. Additionally, at the end of the game, that shame token is going to earn you negative 5 honour points. Alternatively, if you have a horde card sitting in front of you, you may place that shame token onto an unoccupied space on the back of that card. There are two spaces, meaning a total of two shame tokens can be placed onto a horde card. Shame tokens placed onto a horde card provide no negative honour points at the end of the game, but that horde card itself provides no positive points. Additionally, if you ever go to claim a shame token from the pool and either there's no tokens left to claim, or there's no valid soldier or horde card for you to place that shame token under, you immediately lose 5 honour, and in the case where there's no valid place for you to place that token, you just discard that shame token, and this helps track the game time accordingly. And a friendly reminder that in summer, you can discard these shame tokens for too cheap. And that's how you play the Great War. Now before we discuss the two player additions and rule changes, the player screens themselves are provided to let you hide your resources and tactic cards, nothing else. Your command cards are redundant to hide anyway, since this information can be gathered from the card discard pile. Your general, advisor cards and shame tokens are all out on display for the world to see. Last, but certainly not least, there is a fan-made summary available on BoardGameGeek by Stylema, which in my opinion is a must-have. The back of the rulebook is reasonable and has an icon list, but it feels a little bit incomplete, and I would highly recommend following that turn summary, especially on your first playthrough, just to make sure you don't miss any steps. Assuming you're not here for any of the two-player talk, thank you so much for watching. If this has been helpful, please hit the like button. If you'd like to see more of our stuff or you just want to help the channel grow, we would really appreciate a subscription as well. Thank you very much. Now that the rowdy folk with friends have left us in peace, we can finally discuss how the Reed Clan lets a couple of people like us play and enjoy this game. Page 12 of the rulebook lists everything I'm about to say, so please check that out if you're in doubt. In a nutshell, the Reed Clan provides three clerks onto the board, which players are going to take turns moving, and that allows them to fill up regular spaces easier, avoid shame tokens, and mess with the other player just a little bit. But there are a few rules and differences in how the Reed Clan activates locations, so we'll talk about this now. But those rules are listed nicely on the Reed Clan General's card itself, as well as the rulebook. The Reed Clan will never have more than one clerk on any given location, and will always have exactly three clerks on the board. They'll never gain honour, shame, or resources. They'll never pay to save their soldiers. Additionally, any soldier that would go to a rest zone is instead returned to their pool. They simply discard any horde cards that they might have won, and they will also not activate a location if they are the only clerk there. They have the same command card that they play every fall, and will always play it in the leftmost available slot on the command track. The actions of the Reed Clan are performed by the active player, the active player again being the player whose command card it is currently being resolved. If it's the Reed Clan's card being resolved, then the player getting to perform the actions is the player higher in T order, and this player is known as the Overlord. Regarding rules for movement for a Reed Clan's clerks, they follow the exact same rules for normal clerks, with the exception that you need to remember a Reed Clan clerk can only have one in any particular location. As for location changes, the Tea House works as usual for the Reed Clan if their clerk exists there. The Reed Clan will always donate its lumber, stone and gold to the warehouse. When a Reed Clerk is involved with the Temple activation, the active player may discard one of their own shame tokens. 
A read clerk at the embassy allows the current overlord to discard any advisor in the market and refill it as usual. In the builder's encampment, the read plan places a barricade for free with the overlord choosing the location. At the barracks, the overlord player places a read spearman onto any valid vital space. The logistics centre and war academy have no effect for the read clan. All right, friends, thank you so much for watching. There was a lot to get through here. Hopefully this helps you get up and running with the game. Let us know in the comments how your first game has gone and what you think of this game. We think it's pretty good. Uh, looking forward to playing a lot more, though. Yeah, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. See ya. Bye.